He's a pressing monster. He will fit really into our style. If he keeps doing what he's doing and stays at Liverpool, then he's, you know, he's got to be wanting to push the 100 club. Nice first um, game at Anfield, so he will never forget that. I will never forget it, so cool, cool start. Seven goals in his first 11 Liverpool appearances, a Champions League hat-trick, a forward-thinking recruitment approach during the toughest of transfer markets. Diogo Jota's start to life at Liverpool has been remarkable for many reasons. Welcome to the Blood Red channel. I'm Guy Clark as we bring you a special podcast profiling and charting the rise of Liverpool's number 20. How his modest footballing upbringing has led him to one of the most decorated clubs in world football. He decided he's going to take another route. And uh, yeah, like I said, an unusual route. How he's managed to force his way into one of the game's most fabled forward lines within weeks of his arrival. Now it's a genuine conversation about the four rather than just, you know, Firmino, Mane and Salah. And even look ahead to what may lay in store as a giant of the international footballing stage begin their search for an heir. Or a new generation of... um, Portuguese football fan. There needs to be a, a figurehead of, of Portugal Portuguese football. There always has been, for certainly for as long as I've been following before Ronaldo, it was Figo. Um, there's been Eusebio in the past. So there always has to be someone who is at that pinnacle. We'll highlight how Diogo Jota's characteristics of determination, commitment and quality have led him to take centre stage at Anfield. Along the way, we'll hear from an array of experts, from footballing finance to football analytics, what his coaches and managers have shared, Nuno Espirito Santo, Pep Linders and Jurgen Klopp, as well as those who have tracked his rise even from humble footballing beginnings in Portugal. The making of a mentality monster both on and off the pitch. The Blood Red Podcast from the Liverpool Echo. On the 19th of September 2020, Liverpool confirmed the fourth most expensive signing in the club's history behind the likes of Virgil van Dijk, Alison Becker and Naby Keita. Diogo Jota swapped Molyneux for Melwood, putting pen to paper on a five-year deal with the Premier League champions in a deal worth £41 million. A summer in which the Reds had been linked extensively with Champions League winner Thiago Alcantara, this was a deal done with the breakneck speed expected to play in the Liverpool forward line, and in the blink of an eye, they had their man. The Echo's chief LFC writer Ian Doyle picks up how the deal came about. There had been whispers that Liverpool were, were, were been tracking him for some time. We kind of knew that he was on the shortlist, but at, at the time, Saar from Watford was the, the the main guy that they were they were looking at. And as we know, Watford they weren't able to come to an agreement in terms of the payments of the fees. And one of the reasons that they got Jota in is the fact that Wolves didn't want that much up front. And um, this is at a time, of course, when we were in a transfer window where there was for a long time a suggestion Liverpool weren't going to buy anybody. So, uh, or well, certainly not anybody of any great note. And as we know, within the space of about 48 hours, they'd signed Thiago Alcantara and, and Jota. And who'd have thought that of the two, that were uh, about six weeks, two months down the line, that it'd be Jota would be the one who'd be commanding all the headlines. What was it, though, on the surface that the Reds saw to attract them to Jota? Football scouting writer and host of Analyzing Anfield, Josh Williams explains. When Liverpool have beaten players, I think, you know, there's a number of boxes that need to be ticked, basically. And I think Jota just silently, really, in comparison to most other players that Liverpool were getting linked with, you know, high-profile players like Jaden Sancho and, and players like that. I think Jota was maybe a bit more in the background, but as I said, just just tick most of those boxes. Um, in terms of his playing style, I'd say he's quite a, a club type player. I think he's um, quite an intense player, quite direct. Obviously, without the ball, he's inclined to press, very keen pressure of the ball, closing down other players. Um, and I think, obviously, when it comes to his numbers, you know, we know, we know Liverpool are very data orientated. I think Jota's numbers over the course of the past few seasons in the Premier League have have been encouraging and have been the, the kind of numbers that, you know, considering his age, which is another reason why Liverpool will have recruited him. I think he's still only 23 years old. If you, if you couple his age with his underlying numbers and the fact that he was arguably playing for quite a defensive team in Wolves. Um, I think it, it just offered as a profile um, enough encouragement to suggest that Josh is going to make a step up once moving to our field. But 
it's just a case of all those boxes being ticked. And in addition to those future aspects, you know, his potential ceiling and the fact he's being young and all stuff like that, he also adds immediate tactical options for Klopp. I think in the past few seasons, Klopp's had to cope with a front three and very little more, really. I think for a, for a short period, he had Shaqiri as a fourth option in attack. Um, last season, obviously, that wasn't the case, really. And without Shaqiri there, the fourth option's typically been maybe Divock Rigi, um, Minamino, just players that are fine and players that can maybe do a job, but players that don't really have the same quality and I think Joss is coming. And he's added the media's options to what Liverpool are doing. You know, 4 2 3 one's been used, 4 2 3 uh, 4 4 2 was used away at the Etihad recently. So it just looks like a sign that made a lot of sense and I think Liverpool have proven that already. As already referenced, Jota wasn't the only forward linked with Liverpool. Watford's Ismail Assar, Chelsea's Timo Werner and even Arsenal's Nicola Pepe had all been touted with a move to Anfield over the past two years. But as Josh Williams continues, Jota's fast start has largely been helped by one influential character at Liverpool. Timo Werner's had an OK start at Chelsea, but I'm inclined to think if, he, if he'd came to, to Liverpool, his start would have been probably even more encouraging. I think Nicolas Pepe has gone to Arsenal. Liverpool were vaguely linked with them a few years back, but I think Liverpool actually shot that one down quite a bit. But I'm inclined to think that if he did come to Liverpool, um, Klopp would have used them really efficiently. Um, he would have came in when he felt he could thrive. And rather than the way he's currently being perceived, I'd expect him to be to be looked at as, as one of the league's best attackers, probably just simply because of how Klopp integrates these players in. He doesn't rush them, gives them time, brings them in when the matches are correct. And um, it just allows the players to thrive, really. So if Liverpool's system and, crucially, manager Jurgen Klopp have helped enable and unlock Jota's fast start at Anfield, what clues were there, even from his upbringing, to suggest this could be a future Liverpool star in the making? Portuguese football expert Tom Cunder details Diogo Jota's route to the top. It's very unusual for a player to, uh, you know, to reach the elite level in Portugal without coming out of the academy of one of the big three. Uh, just look at the Portugal squad, you know, out of, I, I don't know the numbers offhand, but I'd imagine out of 25 players or 20, you know, 25 man squad, there, there must be just literally one, two or three that, uh, you know, didn't uh, come through that route. And, uh, and yeah, the Ocos is one of them. So, uh, you know, came through at Passos de Ferreira, very small, modest club in uh, Portugal. Usually a club which is starts the season with the aim of just staying in the top flight. You know, if they do that, then that's considered a successful season. And uh, and he was superb. You know, he really, really uh, uh, made people sit up and take notice right from the start because he was still a teenager. I think he's just eighteen years old when he he had this magnificent season. Uh, scored about fourteen, fifteen goals, which you know, it may not sound too much, but in a 34-game uh, season for, like I say, a very modest club, that was that really you know, made people sit up and take notice. After his spell at Pacos Ferreira came a move to Atletico Madrid before being moved out on loan first to Porto and then to Wolves. Crucially, at both clubs, he was managed by Nuno Espirito Santo. Arriving at Molyneux in the summer of 2017 amid an influx of Portuguese influence, former Wolves goalkeeper, now Sky Sports reporter Matt Murray, admits any doubts were quickly expelled. If I'm perfectly honest, though, I didn't know loads about Ruben Neves. I didn't know loads about Diogo Jota. Um, obviously, you heard he played decent in the Portuguese youth side, you know, in the 21 competition. Um, Atletico Madrid had been there. But still, it was OK. It, it was a very, you know, different signing to what Wolves have attracted before. Um, there was always a concern, you know, obviously Nuno's bringing them over, the George Mendes link. And these guys are just coming here, put themselves in a shop window and see you later. And what's going to happen when the yellow balls come out and the winter time and all this sort of stuff. But they all settled really, really quickly. Um, they all hit the ground running. And you've seen it a bit with Helder Costa, Cavalero, um, but Neves and, and, um, and Jota and that, was, you know, really hit the ground running. And what I think was clear straight away to see was Jota, even though he's not the biggest of players, and when you speak to him, you understand why he he is this way. 
he was so robust. You know, the challenges he took and he just picked himself up, he gave it back a bit, he ran with the ball, his energy levels, his intelligence. So, yeah, I think there's, you know, you, you wondered at first how we're attracting players like this and what's their, what's their motivation. But it was clear very, very quickly that these are super hungry, super talented footballers. And yeah, they, and to settle into championship life so quickly was uh, was really pleasing. It's very interesting, the, you know, this kind of Portuguese... The, the, the beginning of the Portugal story at Wolves because players like him, the Jota, who, although he wasn't, you know, I suppose you could say an elite player uh, when he joined Wolves, he was considered a, you know, a very high quality player and certainly a player who could, uh, you know, with all due respect to the English, I know the English Championship second tier is a very high league, but he's certainly considered a player, you know, kind of above that level. And uh, but fair play, you know him, uh, the manager himself, Nuno Espírito Santo, uh, Ruben Neves, for example. They did, you know, if you think about it, that was quite a big risk, wasn't it? Going down the division as well as moving countries, going down to the second tier. But boy, it's uh, it's paid off, hasn't it? So uh, yeah, he's you no, know, it's I think he's been very intelligent the way he's managed his career so far. That spell at Porto, it wasn't. Uh, say it wasn't like a resounding success but it certainly wasn't a failure uh, i remember of course we're talking about you know the, pretty much the strongest side in portugal here one of the two strongest sides uh certainly every single year and like i say champions league guaranteed pretty much every year so they always have a very you know very competitive squad and uh you know it was very difficult for him to make them up remember he was i think 19 maybe when he joined for when he joined porto uh, and so he wasn't an automatic starter there. But even so, that season, he did fairly well. I remember his first, his full debut uh, against, uh, at the home debut. Uh, he scored a hat-trick, and I think he ended the season. Not sure if he got to double figures, but he didn't somewhere near their 9, 10, 11 goals. So, you know, he could have, I suppose, uh, you know, it would have been quite easy for him to say, OK, you know, I'm kind of, got my foot a little bit in the door here in Porto. Let's get my head down and see. Maybe in one, two, three years, I'm um, you know, my first to- choice striker. But no, he was. He decided he's going to take another route. And uh, yeah, like I said, an unusual route, but uh, uh, it's probably one which, if he had stayed at Porto, you know, it's quite uh, difficult to see him being where he is now in terms of his career. So having developed under the guidance of Nuno Espirito Santo, Jota made the move to Liverpool and on the eve of the move with the wheels well and truly in motion, it was the Wolves manager who endorsed the deal, albeit knowing he was losing one of his star performers. Diogo is amazing. You know, everybody knows the, the relationship that, that uh, we built during four seasons and three seasons in particular here in Wolves. Um, what, what Diogo did for us um, it's absolutely fantastic, and um, I think things happen uh, when naturally things should happen. Um, and I think Diogo um, is going to the right place, and we wish him all the best, uh, knowing that he will never be forgotten, especially uh, by our fans. All the things that, all the memorable moments that uh, Diogo provides us during three seasons here at Wolves. I know him when he, since he was very, very young <laughs> because uh, he's from the city Porto. So uh, he grew up at Gondomar, a uh, smaller club. We played against each other, I think, but uh, when he was young and um, then he came through as a to Ferreira. Um, no, but no, in example, in Portugal, they are saying what a great signing Liverpool made because they know exactly how he is and what kind of potential he still has. And um, He's, uh, what I said, he's a pressing monster. He will fit really into our style. Um, but at the same time, his technical level is as the same as the, our front three. So uh, um, we're really happy with him. And all the things we heard are true. <laughs> he's a very professional, very dedicated, passionate, brave uh, player. And uh, yeah. 
Having swapped Wolves for Liverpool, it was Reds assistant manager Pep Linders there who was amongst those who were trying to contain their excitement ahead of Jota's debut in the 7-2 Carabao Cup win over Lincoln City. His technical skill set, one of the most exciting things about the signing, with immediate comparisons made. I don't think he's too different to Sadio Mane or Mohamed Salah, but you've obviously only had those two. Whereas Klopp's always favoured at least a front three, possibly even a front four at times. So with the front three, usually you've had two speedsters on the side, two pacey wide men who were inclined to cut inside, darting behind, and you've had Firmino coming the opposite way. I think Jota just offers an alternative option, a, diff- a different type of solution for certain games. Um, obviously, we saw him play through the middle against Atlanta. Um, and he did do Firmino type things, such as, you know, with seating into midfield, leading the press, linking the play in the final third. But he also offered goals, which Firmino didn't offer. So I think in terms of Origi and Minamino, I think he offers a lot more quality than them. He's a lot more of a similar profile to Salah and Mane. But he can also do aspects of what Firmino does during the game. So, again, it's just a really sensible sign. I can't really... Um, can't really stress that enough. He played down the middle against Atalanta. He played on the right wing against Manchester City and against Sheffield United when they've had the 4 4 2 3 1 Liverpool when he's been in the team. And he's played on the left. And it was one of his early games. I think it may have actually been even been his first game at Lincoln where he was asked where he saw uh, Jurgen Klopp, sorry, was asked where he saw Jota playing and where he saw Minamino who'd scored for, on that day. And he says, oh yeah, uh, Taki's down the middle and Dio goes on the left. Now, Obviously, that, I'm not saying that's completely changed, but it does seem as though Jota has leapt ahead in the sense that he's somebody who can do a job that they thought Minamino would be able to do. In place of Firmino, we, they were trying to bring him in to, to do that and kind of mould him into that. But you know, it's fair play to Jota. That he's, he always had that versatility. The interesting thing for me as well is that he wasn't actually an automatic first choice for Wolves. I'm not saying they were delighted to, to lose the play, but they certainly would have been happy getting £41 million pounds for him, an initial £41 million pounds at that. But the uh, the thing about that is that it's 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 players, isn't it? Players for positions, players for teams. You look at Sadio Mane, £30 million, was it, from Southampton? That people went, oh, that's a lot of money, but now it's, it just seems a no-brainer. The same with Salah. Liverpool have this ability to, to get in players that they need, and no matter what the cost is, the Blood Red Podcast from the Liverpool Echo. Salah, Mane, Firmino. It's still some step to make to reach the levels that they've hit at Liverpool. A combined 269 goals for the Reds under the reign of Jurgen Klopp. Jota's started well, that's for sure. Seven goals in his opening 11 games. Was this a player who was just waiting for the opportunity, though, to explode on the elite level? He's just hit the ground running so much it showed that he does belong on his level because I didn't I think I thought he'd be more of a impact player or you know the lesser games in the Premier League initially I didn't think he'd yeah he'd really make such a statement so early on but he looks like he's just you know he's a good player but I still feel he looks like he's stepped, stepped up another notch Nuno's got a fantastic squad his Liverpool team though is, a, is another level and it looks like yeah he's just thrived on that He stepped up and uh yeah, I think a lot of Liverpool fans will be saying it's a great signing, um, but say thoroughly deserved. But he's, he's 23, 23, and he's already showing how good he is. So I think there's some very, very exciting times ahead and the price tag might start to actually look like a bit of a bargain. I'm pretty sure he was the top scorer for Wolves when they got promoted. So <laughs> that's a player who is quite clearly willing to, to get stuck in. And he, he's, not, he's you know, there are obviously, you know, the championships like it's, it's, it is the most, probably the most difficult league in the world to play in, in the sense that almost every single game is competitive. It's not always about natural skill. And, you know, the games are played hell for leather. So somebody to come in and do that. I mean, he did spend, obviously, some time at Atletico Madrid as well, where he didn't get a game. He was put out on loan. And now there's some questions being asked in Spain about Diego Simeone and whether or not he... Why did he overlook him? I mean, it's easy to say that now because it would have only been about 18, 19, 20 when he went there. But, uh, yeah, Nuno at, uh, at Wolves had him at Porto. That's the re- when he was on loan at Porto, that's the reason that he, he took him to Wolves. He obviously saw a player in him there and he even said that when he was playing, that, I'm just going to try and get this right now, Paco de Ferreira is where he started. In Portugal, he said he'd spotted him there playing, so he was, he was more than happy to take him 
take him on loan from Atletico and, and obviously take him to Wolves. And you've seen with Nuno's comments recently that you could tell he's genuinely made up for the fact that, that Jota's doing really well at Liverpool. In the case of Diogo, he's, he's not a surprise because um, Diogo, Diogo loves the game. Diogo loves to work with Diogo. He's a player that's committed every day and he loves the game. He knows football. He lives for football. He plays, um, watches all the games. So... Um, I'm really happy for you. Really happy for you, and and I hope he continues and and enjoys his game game by game. It's a it's a, it's a joy to see him smile. He has a humility though when you see him around. Like if you're ever doing things to charity, he'd do a pair of boots for you or sign a shirt for you, no problem at all. When you and that's what I'm saying is you'd sit there and talk to you 10, 15 minutes about how things are going and just getting to know the guy. You know, I think he's got a baby on the way and you know he just seems like a really down to earth guy but when he steps onto that pitch he's a winner he's driven yeah his English was good and you can see that yeah he's proper living his dream but he's not taking anything for granted if that makes sense and he's not resting on his laurels he wants to keep pushing on pushing on pushing on and maybe some people looked at him going to Liverpool and the price tag and this and that but he obviously had the belief and Jurgen Klopp made him believe that he could play and improve and uh, as much as I was gutted to see him go, I'm not going to lie, because he's such a fantastic player. So my Wolves put a hat on. But the fact it shows you where Wolves have come, that, you know, a team that's been so dominant, is looking at Diogo Jota and thinking, yeah, he can add to our squad. So, uh, no, really, really pleased for him. And I think if we're perfectly honest, most Wolves fans will give him their blessing, that, give him their, you know what I mean, and, and say he deserves this. And he's brought plenty of smiles to Reds fans' faces. But if his performances and goal-scoring exploits haven't surprised Nuno Espirito Santo, why was he happy to allow one of his trusted stars to leave? Business of football writer at the Liverpool Echo, Dave Powell, explains the nuance behind the Reds' summer spending. You see the the headline fees, don't you? Um, But but the reality is the outlays... Um, a little different, different in the, in the case of the likes of Thiago. I mean, actually, 25 million, I think, represents you know a good bit of business. Um, Shimikas, um, you know, just just north of 10 million for that, it's north of 11 million actually. So it's you can understand that kind of spending. But the Jota one, um, when you see kind of 40 odd million pounds being outlaid in the middle of a pandemic, you um, it kind of raises eyebrows. However, um, it's not been structured in the way where. It, that's forty odd million pound coming out of Jurgen Klopp's transfer budget this year, um, as is going to be the case for a lot of um, clubs now. Certainly, clubs spending um, big amounts. It's going to be spreading that cost over a period of time. And to the selling clubs, it's the security of having um, a continual stream of, of money that they can budget for each financial year. So, I think that's going to be a, a running theme now, which probably may even continue post-pandemic, I think. I think it might change the way that the clubs operate in the main the transfer market. A very modern transfer in every sense. The fee itself, it's around £41 million, um, but what it is, Liverpool will pay um, around 10% of that up front to, to Wolves. So that was paid up front to Wolves on completion of the deal. Uh, I believe another £1 million is due um, to Wolves in December from Liverpool. The rest is paid over time, and that all means that, that Wolves can effectively budget um, moving forward and also for Liverpool I mean they sold Kiana Hoiver to, to Wolves um, so basically you've got 13.5 million coming back into the direction which is again going to be spread over a period of time I think it's about 9 million that Wolves paid up front the rest in instalments um, but for Wolves it, it, it represents good business because it, because of them being um, among the, that group of clubs clustered in the middle of the Premier League there is a there is a limit on the value of a a footballer um, outside of the, the top six. Um, that's just the way it is. If you are um, buying someone, if you're buying Jota f- from Chelsea, um, the value of the value of him is increased, probably closer to the to the ninety million mark. So for Wolves, that's probably. I think they realised they reached the high water mark of what they could sell Jota for. Um, he was an important part of the squad, but the way that um, Nuno was operating, it, he wasn't necessarily starting every week. Um, so I think Liverpool have seen there an opportunity there. Don't have to spend big to get a player that fits the system, um, but also a player that wasn't necessarily playing every week, who whose value had probably reached its height with Wolves. Um, 
So yeah, it makes makes perfect sense. I mean, already Jota's value is is probably twenty. You can have twenty million pound on that if there was a resale value to it now. So it, you know, it's great financial business from Liverpool's point of view. Liverpool seemingly leading the way both on and off the pitch, and already Jota seems to be following a path already set out by both Sadio Mane and Mohamed Salah. The more you look at it, the more you think it, it, it seems patently obvious that they would have signed Jota simply because of the way that he, he's, he's fitted in so well. And as Jurgen Klopp has said a number of times, that he had the best upbringing he could have pro- pro- possibly had uh, by playing at Wolves in the terms of they press very hard, press very high. You know, they've got a lot, a lot into their work rate. There's, they're not the same team as Liverpool, but they have got a lot of the same attributes that's helped him. You look at the likes of Fabinho and Andy Robertson when they first arrived, they they didn't hit the ground running. They took a while, but now they're very integral players. And then you've got, by, by comparison, you look at uh, Sadio Mane and, uh, and Mohamed Salah, and they, they came straight in, started scoring, and, and away they went. So it is interesting. It seems to be that the forwards that Jurgen Klopp brings to the team, most of them anyway, they seem to be the ones who are able to just, you know, get in and get going straight away. I give the boys, the new boys, the time um, they, the individual needs. So, um, and that takes sometimes longer and sometimes not that long. We had other players who, I think Virgil van Dijk played a, a week after um, we signed him or a few days after we signed him and scored the first goal. Um, and that's pretty special as well. So all, it's not, there's not one way for all, for all the players. Um, no, he is the player we thought he will be, and we we, we, we thought as well uh, that we can help him to reach the next level. Um, like he can help us um, to 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 reach the next level because of his quality. So very still very young, twenty three, experienced. Anyway, um, played in a one of the hardest working teams um, you can face with Wolves. Um, you know, a very very demanding manager. So he knows that offensive player has to do different jobs, not only. Um, creating and scoring is to work hard and all these kind of things. So that helps us. That all helps us, and um, and helps him, obviously. So really happy about the, the the impact he had so far. The interesting thing about Jota is that he's managed to force his way into that front three straight away. In the sense that now it's a genuine conversation about the four rather than just you know Firmino, Mane, and Salah. Well, that's obviously to do with the fact that Firmino is he's struggling for form. He's a little bit tired, you know, but that's exactly why Jota's come in. And uh, Liverpool are probably as high up in the table as they are at the moment and on the brink of getting out of the Champions League group after three games because Jota's been able to do that. They, they brought him in and they're looking at it at the right time. And he's, he's had, weirdly, for somebody who was the fourth most expensive, who is the fourth most expensive player ever in Liverpool's history, he had next to no expectation on him because of Thiago joining two days earlier. So he's been able just to crack on and... For him to do what he's done has made such a massive difference for Liverpool in the short term and for him, hopefully, in the long term. It looks like a masterstroke, really, doesn't it? To only pay out of your financial year this year um, what is going to be £5 million um, because they've got another million pound instalment in December is um, is fantastic business, really. You know, And I think already you can see um, the money looks like being a, a snip. Um, everything about Jota, the way he moves, the way he presses, the way he fits into that system, um, it just smacks of, of being a real success. I mean, he's of the age which there's development and it is, his ceiling hasn't been reached yet, much in the same way when they signed Salah. Um, he was undervalued at uh, Roma, um, wasn't utilised properly at Chelsea um, and there was there's a ceiling um, that players have. Salah was nowhere near that and I think um, the, the guy who was heading analytics at Roma at the time, it was Luke Bourne, who's actually part of Red Bull acquisitions, who were trying to, you know, kind of come together with FSG. He um, felt Salah was undervalued and, and thought he was a perfect fit for Liverpool. I think Jota fits into that kind of mould whereby we've not seen, he's, he's not achieved the levels yet, um, which he, he possibly can. And I think eventually that money is going to look like um, a shrewd investment. Um, certainly when you consider it's going to be spread over a period of time, it isn't going to massively affect um, the balance sheet in the next you know, two or three years. And certainly as you, as you move forward to the financial results in the early part of next year, I think this kind of business means that they'll look, won't look as uh, 
as grim as possibly uh, others others may have done, um, notably United in, in recent times. Technically, tactically and financially, it's been a deal that has highlighted Liverpool's sporting success across the board. From the training ground, goals scored and points won on the pitch and financial success too. But what else lays in store for Diogo Jota? Looking at his start at Liverpool, Ian Doyle for one suggests we're only just scratching the surface. By all accounts, just speaking to people at Wolves, he seems to be a player who scores in bursts rather than just consistently, say, like a Salah and increasingly like a Mane. But even so, if he scores the, you know, those bursts come at the right time and Liverpool need the goals, then that's the kind of thing that makes a difference, especially at a time when Firmino, for all his talents, and we know how important he is to the team, he's not perhaps hitting the target as, as often as he should be. So the other thing for Jota is that so many of his goals have been important. I know he's got the hat-trick against Atalanta and uh, the late goal against Arsenal, but the other ones have been equalisers and winners, which, you know, if, if, if you've got a player like that, you can come in and do something like that. And bear in mind that when he was playing for Portugal in not this international, but the last international break in, uh, in October, he replaced Cristiano Ronaldo and scored twice. So... Yeah, if Portugal think he's good enough to do that, then there should be no surprise that he's doing quite well for Liverpool so far. There's a lot of excitement about you know the way he started at Liverpool. He really does seem to have taken his game to another level, and uh, you know every possibility that he will even improve there. But uh, even as uh, you know, even kind of before that, or just while the move was taking place, he'd kind of broken into the Portugal side. He's made a really good impact. In the games in September, Cristiano Ronaldo was injured uh, in one of the games and Diogo Jota was brought in. I think it was his first start and he was man of the match against Croatia. He had an absolutely superb game. Portugal played really well, won 4-1. Uh, he, played, uh, he played his full part in that, scored a goal. And then uh, in the next uh, international break last month, uh, Cristiano Ronaldo, again out, this time with COVID-19, and he came in, Diogo Jota again, and uh, what do you know it? Man of the match again <laughs> against uh, against Sweden. Absolutely superb performance. Uh, again, scored two goals in that game. People from that moment onwards, I think, and, uh, and Fernando Santos, the Portugal coach, he's just it's a no-brainer now. There's absolutely no way that Jota isn't going to be a big part of the Portugal future. The only thing I would say is that I don't think you can say Jota is going to be the replacement for Cristiano Ronaldo, just like I uh, can't even say that about Joao Felix. You know, there's only one Cristiano Ronaldo, but there's a group now of four or five players who are just, you know, it's such at the top of their game and playing for Europe's top clubs. You know, Jota is one of them, of course, and you've got Joao Felix, you've got Bernardo Silva, usually Portugal's front three is Ronaldo, and then two of those three. Uh, and then, you know, just behind, you've got uh, uh, Bruno Fernandes as well. He's doing great things also in England. So it's an exciting time to be, uh, you know, definitely to be a Portugal fan. Supporting and even helping to succeed Liverpool's front three is one task, but being the spearhead of the Portuguese national team may be another entity entirely. Having seen him develop over three years at Wolves, Matt Murray, though, is in no doubt this could be the unlocking of the Reds' next elite talent. I think that obviously he's gone there to win trophies. Every player wants to win trophies and he's going to want to score goals in big games and, and try and make sure that, you know, he's starting a lot more than he's not um he's gonna be especially this season it's a funny season with the different lockdown and this and that but he, he's probably look at it and think well you know of course i was well known in england because of what i'd done and Mane had done the same as at southampton but he wouldn't say he was a world star until he went there and really really kicked on like the other front boys have done so i think van dyke went to another level from going to liverpool everyone loved him at southampton but then when you do what you do for liverpool that kicks you on to another level so I think that Diogo Jota will be looking and saying, look, I want to be seen as one of the best strikers in Europe, best forward players in Europe. And that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to keep playing regularly for my national team, try and get honours there. And I'm going to try and get as many minutes as I can. And if they do look to sell on one of the, you know, that, that you know, you had that amazing front three, didn't you? Firmino, Salah and Mane. And can he force his way into that in, in, in the way of maybe one of them gets sold on or will it be the... The four-two-three-one. It looked like they set up against. You know what I mean, he got him, got them all into the squad, didn't he? So, I think he's just going to want to be as successful as he can, score as many goals as he can, uh, say, 
be a regular starter for club and country. And, and of course, he's going to want trophies. And I think he's going to look and think, I want at least probably either get a big move then onto, a, you imagine, a Real Madrid or a Barcelona or really just become a Premier League great. And I, and I think he's, I think he's got, if, if he keeps doing what he's doing and stays at Liverpool, then he's, you know, he's got to be wanting to push the 100 club and everything else. And But I say he's surely he's got to want trophies. Uh, and we'll believe he can he can achieve that. I think Jota was signed as as a potential heir, really, to particularly Sadio Mane for me. Um, whether Liverpool keep the four or three, three for years to come remains to be seen. But he's, he is very, very similar to Mane in terms of being predominantly right-footed, but being very two-footed at the same time. Playing out wide, but cutting inside. Being very risk, uh, being very embracing risks on the ball and, and stuff like that. Penises in his run. Uh, inclined to score goals, inclined to assist. So I, I do think he's he's an heir to Mane. Now, whether he reaches Mane's level remains to be seen. I will say that his numbers are probably just as good. When, you, when you're watching the, both the two players, maybe Mane looks a little bit better. And probably from an opposition perspective, most opponents would probably prefer to face Mane. But in terms of the numbers side, Jota does rival him in most areas. And... Um, you know, he's, he hasn't played very many matches at all yet, very many minutes at all. But last season, he posted um, about 2.7 shots per 90 in the Premier League for Wolves. Season before, it was about 2.2. Um, for Liverpool this season, obviously very limited minutes. He's posting 3.8. 3.8 shots per 90 is a lot. Um, you know, the, the best strikers in Europe typically post three or above. So if Josh is on around three, you know that bodes well for his for his future. And obviously, his expected goals is good as a result because most of his shots that he does take are close to goal. In terms of his potential ceiling, I, I wouldn't rule out him potentially being as influential as Man is in in maybe three years' time. Josh Williams there looking into what could be to come for Jota. And could that yet be the most exciting prospect? His detailed Jota's determination, hunger to succeed and ability have all led him from Portugal's footballing backwaters to a player being talked about of unlocking even greater heights for the Premier League champions. Taking over from Mane and Salah in spearheading Liverpool's attack may be one thing, but as both of those have seen their profile rocket since hitting stardom at Anfield, could Jota be placed to bring the Reds' untold riches commercially in becoming the poster boy of one of European football's giants on the international scene? For a new generation of um, Portuguese football fan, um, there needs to be a, a figurehead of, of Portugal, Portuguese football. There always has been, for, certainly for as long as I've been following before Ronaldo, it was Figo. Um, there's been Eusebio in the past, so there always has to be someone who is at that pinnacle, you know, who who, who kind of carries the fight. You're not going to get him, get a player like Ronaldo again. It's just not going to happen. Um, but I think Jota will has the potential there, certainly with the way Liverpool are heading, um, because of the way it's all geared for the next ten years. I mean, you can see it behind this FSG and, and Red Bull involvement. It's to, it's to kind of recapitalise the business and bring more more money in to enable them. Um, in times of a bit of a crisis, to to take a bit of a leap on other tides here and and make sure that they give themselves an established footing to move forward and, and continue being a force because they won the Premier League now. Challenges to they they they're the top dogs now. That's it. I mean, it's the, the monkeys off the back. It's um, it's a case now of being a dominant force again. And um, Salamane already gods in their own home country, and I think. Um, Portugal will be crying out for for another superstar, and I think Jota, the way he plays, being among um, Liverpool now, I, I think it can only serve to to kind of help him fill that void. I certainly don't see anyone particularly challenging him for it. Hat tricks, hunger, humility. On the rise to the top, Diogo Jota has stood up to every test. Now the challenge is staying there. It's been a long road back to the top for Liverpool, but in Diogo Jota, they may have found a man to keep them there.